Hello everyone, my name is Shayana Hatchell and I am a diabetes educator with the diabetes program at Children's National. Today I'm going to be talking to you about diabetes safety. So before I get into the skills and what you can do in the home, I'm gonna do a little bit of an overview about what diabetes is and how insulin works in the body. Diabetes in general is a lifelong condition where the body cannot break down the glucose or sugar that we eat properly anymore. There's more than one type, and the main two types are type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune means that the immune system, which is supposed to protect us from infection and diseases, made a mistake and produced antibodies that eventually destroy the cells inside of the pancreas that produce insulin. We call those cells beta cells. Once those cells are destroyed, the body can no longer make insulin on the inside, and so the only treatment for type 1 diabetes is to give insulin from the outside. Now this is different from type 2 diabetes, which is a condition where the body is still producing insulin, so it's not autoimmune at all, it's just that that insulin is not being used properly anymore. So for someone with type 2 diabetes, the treatment can be lifestyle modification, insulin, or pills to help the body use what it's making properly again. But for type 1 diabetes, the treatment is insulin. So now that I've used that word insulin a few times, how about we talk about why insulin is so important? Insulin is the key that unlocks our cells so that sugar can go inside to be used for energy. So every time we eat a meal, anything with carbohydrates gets broken down in the stomach and turns into glucose or sugar. And once that sugar goes into the bloodstream, the insulin is the only thing that can get it into our cells to give us the fuel that we need. Now that I've gone over what diabetes is and how insulin works in the body, I'm going to be going over a couple of our safety skills. In the next segment, we'll talk about how to check your blood sugar. So now, we're gonna be talking about how to use a home glucometer. We're gonna be using this meter here for demonstration purposes, but this is not the only meter that is available. The glucometer that you will use is based on your insurance and that can be determined with your healthcare team. So with all meters, you have four different parts. You have the actual meter, you have the test strips, you have the lancing device, and you have the actual lancet or the needle that does the poke. The first thing that you do is set up the meter because the date and time is always very important when you're going to your clinic visits. Every meter setup is a little bit different, but usually there's a power button and then there's a way for you to go through the time and make sure it's correct and then go through the date. The only other time you need to go back in and change anything is during daylight savings, but that's very important. The next part of the meter, just so that we can talk about that one in a little bit more detail, is that lancing device. The dial there at the bottom is how deep or how hard it pokes the finger. The higher the number, the deeper or harder the poke. You will determine the number that you need with your healthcare team. And the next part is the test strips. They come inside of a container, and it's really important that whenever you're not grabbing a test strip out, that you keep that container closed because these strips are really sensitive to sunlight and to the moisture in the air. So whenever you're not grabbing one, or when you do grab one, you wanna make sure that you close it right back and that it stays closed in between. If you happen to open up your bottle and the strips fall out, as long as the space that it fell out on was clean and dry, you can put those test strips back in. But if you're concerned about the area having any type of liquid on it or not being clean, throw those test strips away and get some new ones. So now I'm gonna show you how to check a blood sugar. Step one is to always clean your hands. So if you can get to a sink, wash them with soap and water. While you're preparing for the test, you can have them actually clean off what finger they would like with an alcohol pad. So while they're cleaning their finger, then you can set up the home lancing device. 
So you take the lancet and you place it inside and then you twist the top until it pulls off. Then you replace that top. Remember we talked about the dial down here so you want to make sure before you use it that you have it at the right number. Now we're ready. The only thing we need to do before we do the actual poke is grab a test strip. Remember to close that top. Place it inside of your meter. And once you do that, you get 30 to 45 seconds to actually do the poke and get the blood onto the strip. If it is that the meter turns off before you've actually put the blood on the strip, just take the test strip out and place it back in and it will reset the meter. Now go to that clean finger. You can massage it a little bit to get some blood down to the top of it. Take your lancing device and go to the upper outer side of the finger, never in the middle. Put some pressure and poke. Once you do that, you should get a nice little blood drop. Take your meter and apply that blood onto the strip. After you do that, your meter will count down and it'll give you the blood sugar reading. So now that you have your blood sugar reading, you wanna make sure that you clean up your space. So you take your test strip out and that can go in the trash can and then you put the meter back inside of its case. Now remember, with the lancing device, it's a one-time use only for that needle. So you wanna make sure that you take it out and that you properly dispose of this part into your sharps container. Once you've taken that out, that goes back inside of the case as well. And then you can put your meter away to be used next time. Now I would like to emphasize the importance of understanding that there is no such thing as a bad blood sugar. The number that you receive is data and information for your family and your healthcare team to make sure that we're keeping those blood sugars in the safest range. So don't be too hard on yourself. Next, we're gonna talk about how to administer insulin in the home. Now, let's talk about how to administer insulin in the home. You could be administering insulin in three different ways. That's with vial and syringe, insulin pins, or with an insulin pump. If your insurance company covers vial and syringe, and that is what your healthcare team determines is the best way for you, please talk to them in order to learn how to properly use that. Now I'm gonna show you how to use insulin pins. If you know how to use one pin, you honestly know how to use them all because their functionalities are exactly the same. They just usually look a little bit different. Now with these two, they actually do look the same and there's only one minor difference and that is the increments in which they dose. So for this one, it doses in whole unit increments and for this one, it doses in half unit increments. With either or, the first thing that you always do with an insulin pin is you open it and check the insulin. Each pin comes pre-filled with 300 units. And if you're using fast acting insulin or long acting insulin, that insulin should always be clear. So before you use it, you always check to make sure that the insulin inside is in fact clear. Next, you wanna check the functionality of the dial for dosing. And you do that by just checking the clicks to make sure that it's actually going to move. If that is working and you know how much insulin you're ready to give, then all you need is your pin, your pin needle, and an alcohol pad. So step one is to clean the top of the pin with an alcohol pad. Clean it really good, guys. Get in there and clean it good. 
<laughs> and then you turn to the other side and you clean the skin so that the skin has time to dry. While it's drying, you take your pin top, is what I like to call it, or the needle. You're going to peel off the wrapping, place it on top of the pin, and you twist until you meet resistance. Then you're gonna take off that big clear top, you're gonna take off the little top that's under it, and the needle is out. Before you ever give a dose of insulin, you wanna make sure that you get out any air, you get out any bubbles, and that the needle is actually on there correctly. And you do that by taking the dial to two, holding the pin straight up in the air, and pushing two units out. As long as you see insulin come out, then you know that that pin is working and now you're ready to actually administer the dose. So take your dial and go to the units that you need to administer. So we'll pretend that we need to give 10. When administering, you wanna hold the pin like this because you wanna focus on just pressing the button and not pushing too hard into the skin. And our thumb is our strongest digit. You wanna go to the skin, pinch the fat, and you wanna have the pin where the dial is facing you, and you go in straight 90 degrees, push all of the insulin in until that dial goes to zero. You let go of that pinch, and then you count between six to 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you take it out. Now that you've administered the insulin, you're gonna take the big clear top, place it on, and then twist that used needle off. Now this needle goes into a sharps container. Every other part of this can just go into the trash. You can replace your top and then that pen can be used again later. So for storing insulin pens, it's really important that when you receive new insulin from the pharmacy, if you're not going to open it and start using it immediately, you place that insulin in the refrigerator. And it's good until the expiration date on the box. Insulin that you're using can remain at room temperature. Now insulin cannot exceed 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're gonna go somewhere hot, you wanna make sure that you keep that insulin around something cool. Now as far as sites where you can inject the insulin, you always inject in the fat. And those locations are the back upper hip, the back of the arms, the abdomen two inches away from the belly button, and the sides of the thighs. Remember to always rotate your injection sites so that you don't have what we call lipohypertrophy, which is an accumulation of fat on one area after using that spot over and over again. This can cause the insulin to not absorb as well and result in higher blood sugars. Now, we're gonna talk about high blood sugars and low blood sugars. Let's talk about low blood sugar. Low blood sugar is anything less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And some of the signs and symptoms include hunger, feeling extremely tired, dizziness, headache, feeling shaky, confusion, and mood swings. If you feel any of these symptoms or you see any of these signs in your loved one, then the first thing you wanna do is always verify with a finger stick. If you check the blood sugar and it is in fact 69 milligrams per deciliter or less, then you treat it with fast acting carbohydrates. Please talk with your healthcare team in order to determine how much of that you should give. After 15 minutes, you recheck that blood sugar and once it's back above 70 milligrams per deciliter, you have fixed it. Now, if you find your loved one unconscious or having a seizure, then you would use your emergency kit, which is called glucagon. Glucagon now comes in three different types. Your traditional glucagon injection, boxemi, which is a nasally inhaled version, 
and GVOC Hypopin, which is a pin version. Now let's talk about high blood sugar. High blood sugar is any reading over 200 milligrams per deciliter. This is not an emergency and can usually be managed in the home. Signs and symptoms of high blood sugar include hunger, drowsiness or feeling tired, frequent urination, and extreme thirst. If you see these signs and symptoms in your loved one, then you check a blood sugar. If it is over 200 milligrams per deciliter and it is time for an insulin injection, then one of the treatments can be insulin. You can also treat high blood sugar with exercise and increased fluids. If the blood sugar remains above 350 milligrams per deciliter two times in a row, then you should check your child for ketones. Ketones develop when the body has to eat the fat for energy instead of using the food that we eat for energy. A way that you can test for ketones in the home is through the urine or in the blood. If ketones are small to trace, then the treatment would be to increase fluids even more and recheck for ketones in about an hour to make sure they're trending down and not up. If ketones are moderate to large, you should call your healthcare team immediately to receive further instructions. Wow, we've gone over so much. We've talked about what diabetes is. We've talked about how to use a home glucometer, how to administer insulin in the home, high blood sugars, and low blood sugars. Now this information is just an overview and for more specific instructions for your child or your loved one, please follow up with your healthcare team.